All right, uh, so just a couple of things from, so there, I think there was a typo. Um, so if the mass is very large, this should uh, be exponentially small, right? And uh, the number of particles, so I think it should be a plus here, but I'll double check. I had written a minus, so I'll double check this and get back to you. Also, people ask me about the, the coefficient up front in this mode function. So I didn't write it here, but uh, if, you, if it's a canonical field that appears in the action, if you have the action like d mu phi, d nu phi, root g, g mu nu, with a minus 1 half, then, um, then this will be the coefficient that appears up front, okay? So this is important because if you, if you want to study the two-point function now, phi k1, phi k2, as eta goes to zero, the late time two-point function, so this will be given by some delta function because of momentum conserve, because of translation symmetry, there is momentum conservation, and then you're gonna get h, squared over 2k cubed, okay? So you see that there is some non-trivial amount of power imprinted at, uh, at all length scales. And actually, if you Fourier transform some, um, some scale invariant two-point functions, so meaning that you, you put the same amount of power at all distance scales, you will get uh, even though this has 1 over k cubes and a delta function, this is related to scale invariant power spectrum, okay? So this, uh, first of all, power spectrum and two-point function are the same thing. These are just words. And uh, yeah, confusingly enough, in cosmology, the three-point function is called uh, the bi spectrum, even though it's bi, it's uh, the three point function. And uh, you can imagine the four point function is called the tri spectrum. <laughs> okay, so it's not my fault, don't ask me why. Uh, but uh, anyway, so, so this is what uh, I guess a particle physics would uh, call these things, and this is uh, cosmological. Uh, name of those uh, correlations. Okay, very good. So now, um, so this is for a canonical, a canonical quantization. And we're going to, this is, the fact that this is a canonically quantized field will be important now that we discuss the two-point function in inflation. Okay? So from the, from this morning, we learned that um, quantum fields, they are, in, in the Sitter space, scalar fields are characterized by their mass. So if they are very heavy, they, uh, their power red shifts away. And, if they're, and here, for example, even for relatively light fields, you see that their two-point function goes like eta squared. So there's two mode functions. It goes like eta squared. So the power gets red shifted away as I send eta to zero. And then you need a very light, for calculational purposes, massless scalar field around that will give you some non-trivial two-point function at late times, okay? So now let's discuss uh, how, how this operates uh, during inflation. So this is a crash course on inflation. So inflation is trying to address a puzzle, right? Uh, the puzzle is that the universe is big and very homogeneous. And if you, given the constituents of the universe and what we know about the standard hot Big Bang picture, if we trace things back to the actual Big Bang, it looks too good to be true. It looks too homogeneous. We don't have a, a good mechanism that explains why the universe looks so homogeneous from a very early time on, okay? In particular, 
if you uh, remember those correlations that I was uh, showing earlier, earlier in the blackboard, so there is a, a, a related puzzle uh, that people usually phrase in terms of the actual uh, structure of the universe, like uh, it's homogeneity and so on, but we can relate it back to the fluctuations. So let me just show the puzzle focusing on the fluctuations themselves. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna do the following. I'm gonna erase this because I'm gonna make a long timeline of the universe. So here's a timeline of the universe. We are here, us, and we observe, we observe our past light cone. And then as you go higher up in, in redshift, you start to see large scale structure of the universe. So there is, you know, the large, uh, there's like the, this chalk. There is the large scale structure of the universe. There are like dark matter filaments and galaxies. These are my galaxies. Okay, so galaxies around. Here's the large scale structure of the universe. And then if you keep going backwards, at some point you go to high enough redshifts and structure hasn't formed yet. So you have something called the dark ages here in between. So the dark ages, and the, the only thing you really have is uh, hydrogen. So in principle, there is a huge amount of information here, but very hard to measure. People are trying to measure it right now. So it's related to 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. So if we can measure this 21 centimeter line, it's a good tracer of uh, the universe at for some broad range of redshifts, all the way back to the cosmic microwave background, which, uh, well, which is really just a snapshot. So here is the cosmic microwave background. So we measure hot and cold spots. This is very hot. This is this hot. This is like cold. So we have these cold and hot spots. And we can measure correlations over the sky. And we get these beautiful plots when we do that. So let me. This is my attempt. So if you plot, as, so you take a ruler, okay? You take a ruler, some fixed angular separation in the sky. So I'm gonna plot, I don't know, like some angu angular separation. And then for fixed angular separation in the sky, you look at how much, uh, how, how much is the size of the over density compared to the average density of the universe. And you correlate and you see at fixed angular separation if there is also some over density. And you multiply the, these two over density. So you get something like delta rho over rho bar uh, of uh, zero, zero, delta rho over rho bar of theta. So for fixed angular separation, you average over the whole sky this product of, uh, of the size of the fluctuations, and you get a plot that, I don't know, looks like, uh, looks like this, okay? Some curve, some interesting curve. Now you repeat the same exercise for the CMB. Now fixed angular separation in the sky. Yeah, here, hmm, unfortunately, this is angular separation, so I need, uh, uh, I need, Angle, angles to grow in this direction, sorry. That's not how we usually plot this. So I just want to make it look like the plots that you see. So if you put large angular separations here on the left, small angular separations here on the right, then you get these plots that I'm sure you have seen, these plots by Planck, starts kind of flat, then there is a huge peak, there are some peaks and then it falls off. Well, here now I'm showing uh, 
the temperature fluctuation. So delta T over T bar theta, delta T over T bar zero. Okay. And uh, okay. So we have these correlations, and we know the constituents of the universe given our cosmology, dark matter, photons, whatnot. We know how they interact. And then we trace these things back to the hot Big Bang. Okay? So we trace these things back to the hot Big Bang. So time is going in that direction. So if we trace things back to hot Big Bang, then we find that the gravitational potential here on this initial time slice will look like this as a function of uh, separation. Oh, sorry. You look pretty boring, uh, so I'm writing the gravitational potential. I don't know. It will be more precise in a second, the Newtonian potential or something like that. And it's pretty much scale invariant. So at all, at all scales, and I'm exaggerating, you get you get a uh, uh, same amount of power and at uh, shorter distance scales you get slightly less power okay actually i'm confused by yeah this looks weird so angles grow ah sorry Yes, very, sm very small angles here, very large angles here. Okay, this is correct. Very small angles, short scale. Okay, yeah, I think that that's correct. So, it's, I mean, I'm exaggerating. There is a small uh, tendency to have less power at, at short distance scales, at small angular separation, but it's very small. Okay, so this is, highly exaggerated. So these are two numbers that uh, control our standard model of cosmology. So if you look at this two-point function of the initial fluctuations, they are characterized by some amplitude and there are some small, um, there are some small, if I write, uh, let's be more precise, k1, k2, there's some delta function because of uh, translational symmetry and then there's the usual one over k cubed and then there's some small uh, deviation from pure scaling variance that's uh, unfortunately I always get confused the people write it as a very a number very close to one minus one okay for historical reasons so this is called the spectral index And this is called the amplitude of primordial fluctuations. Okay. So AS, so when people say that the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background and so on are or of order one part in 100,000, you probably have heard this. Story, what they mean is that this AS is order 10 to the, uh, it's order 10 to the minus 5 squared, okay? In more detail, there's a 3 up front here, so it's really like order 10 to the minus 9. Maybe there's a 3 here, okay? So this number is measured. Uh, we can, we need it to fit the CMB and large scale structure, and an S minus 1, is also measured and uh, it's, uh, this number is wrong, okay? But it's very small, it's order, I don't know, 0 0.04, something like that, okay? So these two numbers are necessary to fit the data and they are related to the initial conditions of the universe. But then that's it, okay? So these are, these two numbers, I'm gonna explain now how you generate this, uh, this story here. But uh, if, you, if you are given these two numbers, then you can explain those curves up there, given the actual constituents of the universe, the amount of dark matter, the amount of uh, 
of uh, cosmo how much cosmological constant there is at late times and so on. Okay? But the two primordial numbers are these uh, AS and an S minus one. Okay. But now there's a puzzle. Uh, unfortunately, I'll ha I want, unfortunately, I want to erase everything I wrote here to continue the timeline. So I'll say it in words to give you some time to write this. So if you trace, so we are seeing these correlations over very, very wide angular scales. Okay. But you know, between the Big Bang and the time that the CMB is produced, there is only so much time. So how can you have non-trivial correlations over two points that were never in causal contacts? Okay. So that's a little bit of a puzzle. You can say it's fine-tuned, but uh, you know, you, people had the same puzzle for the, for the full universe, the, the, the actual uh, shape of the universe at large scales. And the mechanism that was proposed to solve this issue also explains where these fluctuations come from. So that's uh, one piece of evidence that, that gives you hope that this is the right framework. Because the solution that was proposed to this puzzle of uh, the homogeneity of the universe, the fact that the universe appears like flats and like homogeneous everywhere, also is a classical solution. And once you take into account quantum effects, you explain this curve here. So I'd say that that's pretty powerful because it gives you something that you didn't ask for. So it gives you an explanation for these, for these uh, correlations. So this mechanism is a cosmic inflation. So the idea is that you put, even though there, there has been only so much time for, you know, if I start from here and I take a light cone and I propagate it upwards, then I wouldn't be shocked if uh, points over these angular scales are correlated, but anything beyond this angular scale looks weird because there's only been, there's only been so much time from the hot Big Bang to this moment. This angular scale, if you work the details out, is actually pretty small, okay? It's around one degree in the sky. So actually, you don't even need two points in this direction to be puzzled. If you point like this, just a little bit off, one degree, you should already be puzzled. How come the universe looks so similar if I just move my angular scale a little bit? Okay? So that's what inflation does for you. And the way it solves the problem is very simple. It just gives you more time okay, to put everything in causal context. Sorry, I shouldn't have written this here. So now we extend backwards the timeline of the universe. And for all practical purposes, inflation is kind of like the Sitter space, OK? So there's some phase here, inflation. So now all things that you see in the sky were very close to each other. Uh, earlier on. And we don't know for sure if this actually has a beginning or not, but once we have this, uh, this phase here, then the entire visible universe was a small patch that was within, for which there was enough time for non-trivial correlations to be set up. And because it's an expanding universe, so it's for all practical purposes like the sitter, there's going to be spontaneous particle production. So now you have these, uh, you know, it's, uh, you have some scalar field around, the scalar field that actually is responsible for setting up this, uh, this non-trivial background, and then the quanta will be pair produced. Okay. So this uh, pair production of quanta is such that you have tiny lumps of energy here, and through gravitational conversion of energy into geometry, you set up the initial conditions of the universe, okay? So we need a few ingredients. We need something responsible for setting up this decider phase, okay? And we need gravity, and that's pretty much it. You have gravity plus some extra matter constituents, and then you'll be able to set up this uh, initial conditions. Okay, so hopefully these arches are clear. It's just 
in the timeline you have some spontaneous pair production and then this pair each one goes its own way and then you set up over these large angular scales you can set up correlations because they were in causal contact earlier on okay so that's the so that's the story we tell ourselves to explain where these two primordial numbers come from okay any questions about this cuz <laughs> it sounds like a uh, magic right but uh well again this was not designed to solve this problem. It was designed to, solve, to show how come the universe looks the same at large scales in all directions. But once you take into account, you know, the classical solution would just give you a flat, boring, uniform slice. But now once you take into account quantum corrections, uh, there are many ways to think about it. If you take into account quantum corrections, then you're going to generate tiny bumps here. So the, the, the surface will be bumpy, and you will be bumping precisely the right way to explain the formation of structure in the universe. So I would say that it's a pretty compelling myth. Okay? And uh, it has some, some strong uh, corroboration from data. All right, so let's uh, discuss. So inflationary model building is, uh, is a huge area. There are many ways of setting up this, uh, this inflationary area. And so I'm just going to discuss the basic one to show you how we compute the two-point function, this, uh, this power spectrum, to explain how we get those two numbers, AS and NS. Because as you'll see, I need to switch on gravity. So I need to explain something else, which is we see these scalar fluctuations, the fluctuations in the Newtonian poten potential, but we don't see primordial gravitational waves. So we need to explain this hierarchy also. Because, you know, it's general relativity. The universe as a whole is uh, actually, uh, you know, has, there is some net quadrupole, so it is producing primordial gravitational waves, which people are trying to measure now. But we haven't measured them yet, so you need to explain also this hierarchy. So I'm going to show you how we do that. All right. So now let's model inflation. And uh, one way to model inflation is um, by assuming that there's some, there's some scalar field that acts like a cosmological constant, who has a potential. The potential of the scalar field acts like a cosmological constant. Recall that this is the solution of Einstein's equations when I have a positive cosmological constant. But you want inflation to stop, and you want to have some scalar field around to set up the, the initial conditions. So the, the most minimalistic way of doing that is in what's called slow row inflation. So the idea is that you have uh, some scalar field, let's call it phi, with some potential, V of phi. And, uh, okay, so the potential, let's draw some potential that looks like this. Then what you want is, is you want to give some initial conditions for this scalar field such that uh, you can essentially ignore its kinetic energy. And uh, most of the energy budgets of the scalar field is coming from, from the potential. Okay? So you, you could, for example, start really high up in the hill here. So you start from high up here, or you start, I don't know, from s somewhere like flatter, like s this region here. You don't want to start from the bottom because then you don't have uh, uh, the right initial conditions to have this inflationary error. But assuming, assuming that you're starting life, you know, either to the left or to the right, and uh, the field has relatively high energy density, then the equations of motion of the scalar field coupled to gravity are such that for a, a very long time, the sitter space will be a good approximation to the background solution, okay? 
So uh, the action for this theory is going to be the most uh, economical possible. So you need gravity. So that's uh, inevitable. So there's going to be the Einstein-Hilbert term. Uh, and uh, well, by definition, the coefficient up front, which is related to the Newton constant, I'm just calling M Planck. Okay. And then there's some scalar. That's it. So it's really just Einstein gravity with a scalar field. Okay. Now, so, so how many degrees of freedom the, does this uh, theory have? One, two, three, four, a hundred, less than a hundred, more than zero. One, two, three, four, there's three, okay, three degrees of freedom, the scalar, Phi and uh, the metric G one and two. Okay. So just a quick reminder of how the counting works. So uh, because you're trying to make locality manifest, you you introduce the metric, but then you have to introduce all of these gauge redundancies to remove some degrees of freedom of the metric. So therefore, gauge redundancies, coordinate reparameterizations. The metric has 10 components. We're in four dimensions. So from 10 components, you we remove four from uh, fixing a coordinate system. And gravity is really a constraint system in the sense that all the zero components of the metric don't have time derivatives. They're pure constraints. So there are four Gauss's laws. Unlike in gauge theory, there's one Gauss law. Here, there are four Gauss's laws, so that removes four more degrees of freedom. So that's where the two comes from. Okay. It is important. Uh, so this four is just coming from gauge symmetry. So any run of the mill thing that you write here that has uh, Riemann curvatures and stuff like that will remove four degrees of freedom. But these extra four are not entirely trivial. It's coming from the fact that everything, every time G appears with a zero, uh, component zero mu, uh, it, there are no time derivatives acting on it. Okay, so they are Lagrange multipliers. They are not dynamical. So Lagrange. Okay. So there are three degrees of freedom. So naively we'll have uh, to compute the two-point function. Not naively, we really have to compute the two-point function of these, um, of these uh, different degrees of freedom, okay? So how do we do that? So up to now, um, so the background evolution such that I have a, the metric and uh, I'm assuming that the scalar field will have some non-trivial profile, phi bar of t. Okay. So the, the scalar field will give some natural foliation. So the scalar field is evolving with time. And then uh, the, the value of the scalar field will provide you know, some natural foliation of the space time. Okay? So I can use the value of the scalar field as some sort of clock. Okay? So this is, uh, I don't know, phi minus infinity of t, then phi phi n, t, phi n minus 1, phi of r. So the, the scalar, and so on. So the scalar field has some non-trivial profile. Actually, I should have put this here. 
Cn, etc. You have some non-trivial profile, and it gives some natural slicing of uh, of uh, the background. Okay, and then a of t must solve the Einstein plus Klein-Gordon equations. Okay. And, okay, so generically, given V of phi, this will be some coupled set of equations, which is kind of complicated. But now we want to have some approximate De Sitter solution. And uh, we assume that the potential is fairly flat and so on. So now I'm going to make this precise. So now we go to so-called slow row approximation. In the slow row approximation, it really boils down to the potential energy of the scalar is much bigger than the kinetic energy. Okay. So if you do that, then it's not hard to believe, right? So now, if, you, if I can throw, if phi only depends of t, then the gradients drop off from the action. And I'm assuming that the kinetic energy is much less than the potential. So then you're back to Einstein gravity with some cosmological constants. No, it's V of phi bar. So then you shouldn't be surprised that the classical solution uh, of the, of, for A of t is uh, the sitter, right? So then in that case, there, there will be some, some A of t solution. And uh, given that I wrote it like that, then the Hubble parameter which will now be time dependent generically is just a dot over a and it's approximately constant. Okay. And now we want to quantify what we mean by approximately constant. So the way to do that is to introduce some measurements of how fast the Hubble parameter is changing during inflation. And for that, we introduced, uh, uh, you know, by so-called slow row parameters, something called epsilon minus h dot over h squared. So this is dimensionless, okay? So h has dimension one over time. So one over time squared, one over time squared. And some second parameter, sorry, notational clash. Eta is just something related to how slow the Hubble parameter is changing, it has nothing to do with conformal time. Okay? It's just that this is the standard notation. Epsilon dots, where epsilon I just defined over epsilon h. Okay? So we want these two parameters to be much less than one. So then in the slow row approximation, these are two small parameters in the problem. Okay? Epsilon really controls uh, how close to pure de Sitter you are. And eta uh, is kind of related to the mass of this scalar field. So how uh, the second derivative of the potential, which uh, if I expand around the fiducial value of phi, phi bar, the, it's, so V double prime is related to this parameter eta. Okay? So I want the mass of the scalar field to be very small in Hubble units. And I want the background solution to be very close to the sitter. So now you wouldn't be surprised that we're, again, very close to studying the massless scalar field in the sitter space. These two conditions here are ensuring that I have a very light scalar field and I'm very close to the sitter space. Okay? So I need to engineer some potential such that uh, I'm in this regime and, and these uh, two conditions are satisfied. So then what happens when I, so this is the background solution. This is the background. Now let's study the fluctuations of this, uh, because I'm interested in the fluctuations. Okay. Ah, maybe I write the, um, 
So these are just definitions. What are the actual equations of motion? The equations of motion. It's just the Klein-Gordon equation and the Einstein equation, uh, or Friedman equation, I guess. So you get something like this. Okay, and uh, if you're not used to M Planck, M Planck squared is one over eight pi g newton. Okay. All right. So, so from here you see that if phi bar dot is much smaller than v, then h is pretty much constant and and uh, controlled by the by the potential. Okay. While here you see that a small kinetic energy is given a small change in the Hubble parameter. So you can trade your given cosmological history, some h of t, by some classical field following a certain potential and having a certain kinetic energy. Okay, so it's a rewriting of, so you, you, by picking a certain scalar field and a certain potential, you make your putative uh, cosmological evolution, uh, an actual solution of Einstein's equations. Okay. So now let's study the fluctuations because that's what we care about. That's really where the observational juice is. Fluctuations. So this was the background solution and now we consider small fluctuations. So phi of t and x And uh, then I have G I J T of X. Okay. Before I write G I J, one thing. So naively, the um, the scalar field will fluctuate. Okay. The scalar field will fluctuate and. And uh, uh, that's where the scalar, the scalar part of the three degrees of freedom is. But I can, I can, because this is gravity, I have four gauge conditions. So I can pick my time coordinates such that uh, I'm slicing space time. With, so, so constant time means constant phi bar. So if I do that, I can set the fluctuations of this field to zero. So that I can set to zero by a choice of gauge. It's kind of like going to unitary gauge in the in the Higgs physics. Okay? And then, but then the scalar fluctuation doesn't disappear. It gets eaten by someone else. And here, our gauge field is the metric. So very much like the Higgs mechanism, there's something that acquires a, a background VEV. And then the fluctuations get eaten by some gauge boson. Okay? So in, in this case, it's the graviton. So now the, in the graviton sector, I'll have two fluctuations, one related to standard gravitational waves and one related to the, to the scalar field. Of course, you can also think of everything in terms of a gauge in which I only have graviton fluctuations in G and the scalar fluctuations are here, but uh, this gauge is more convenient for, for, uh, for connecting to, late, to the late universe because it's really related to the, to the Newtonian potential at early times, okay? There are other reasons why we're, we care more about this gauge, but anyway, it's just a choice of coordinates. There's nothing magical going on here. Another thing, why am I writing Gij? Because the zero components are pure constraints, okay? So I can, there, there's no, deg there are no degrees of freedom there. So I'm supposed to fix Gij and then solve for the zero components and plug, plug the solutions back in, okay? Is that clear? Okay, so if you do that, uh, the, the background's 
the background uh, gij is just uh, a squared dx squared. And uh, you're going to get, so now I have gij dx i dx j. So the background was just a of t squared. Now I get delta ij plus gamma ij. So this will be the graviton degree of freedom. But now there's a scalar degree of freedom. And it's just uh, conventional to write it like this two zeta delta ij. Okay. So this zeta variable is related to the local curvature. So if you compute on, on your slice, if you compute the, the Riemann, the, the Ricci scalar, it's roughly speaking related to the gradient of this variable zeta here, okay? So gamma ij and zeta will be space-time dependent. They will depend on, on t and x. And I'm working to a leading order in perturbation theory. So these are the fluctuations, okay, on top of this background. So again, I have that background over there. And now I'm going to study it's quantum field theory in a curved background. Now I'm going to study small quantum fluctuations on top of that background there. And I'm going to have some spontaneous particle production effects that's going to set up those uh, two-point functions for the early universe. Okay? All right. Questions? All right, so now I'm going to tell you the answer, and I'm going to skip how you. So this is not entirely trivial, OK? Because you have to compute the, the action of the theory. So one nice thing is that uh, at leading order, if you only work to quadratic order, the gamma, the gravitons, and the scalars don't talk to each other. So you're going to have a quadratic action for the gravitons, another quadratic action for the zeta, and there is no linear mixing. There is nothing proportional to zeta gamma in the quadratic action. Okay? So that's one thing. Second thing is that you need to solve for the zero components of the metric. There will be functions of gamma and zeta. I forgot to say that uh, the graviton is traceless transverse. The trace parts of the gravitational fluctuation is the zeta. So I have to solve for the zero components. They are non-trivial. Okay, so this, uh, if you want to see everything in glorious detail, I suggest you look at a paper by Maldacena, 2002, uh, in which he does this computation in a lot of detail. So then he writes the zero components of the metric, plugs them back in, expands the action to quadratic order, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I'm going to tell you the final answer. So the final answer, you're not going to be impressed when I write the final answer, but it takes a lot of work to get there. So but here's the final answer. Actually, you should kind of expect for something for the final answer. So first of all, gravitons are massless. Okay? So the, the action should probably look like the action for a massless scalar field. And because of these low row conditions, we also expect the scalar degree of freedom to have the action of a massless scalar in uh, the sitter space. So there's really very little that, that the answer can be. So the action for the scalar is going to be given by integral root g, g mu nu, d mu zeta, d nu zeta. That's it. But I'm, I'm keeping this. And the action for the graviton, so the graviton um, is given by this, root g, g mu nu, gamma ij where I'm contracting the indices here with the, um, with the Euclidean metric, okay? These ij's here. So now you're like, what? where is the work 
the work is in figuring out what appears up front here. Okay? So all this work of epsilons and blah, 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 will essentially pin down the numbers that appear here up front. And if you do things carefully, you get M Planck here. Recall that these are um, dimensionless numbers, okay? So they are related to components of the of the metric. So there, there are you know two derivatives here. So you need two more mass, uh, something to soak up the dimensions. And uh, here, well. If you, if you were M Planck squared again, you would arrive at the conclusion that gravity waves are produced with the same amount of power as scalar fluctuations. So then we should have seen them already, but we don't. Uh, but somehow this computation gives you, gives you the right answer. Yeah. So you're going to get M Planck squared times this factor epsilon. Okay. So somehow all the work is in figuring out that you have an epsilon here. So this number is very small, but it means that uh, if I canonically normalize this field, I have to absorb this epsilon, this M Planck up front. So the two-point function of the scalar will be parametrically larger than the two-point function of the gravitons by this factor epsilon, okay? Or one over epsilon, in fact. So the two-point function of the scalar fluctuations, K1, K2, evaluated at late times, as eta goes to zero. Uh, and in detail, it's given by this. It's one over two epsilon h over two pi m Planck squared times delta And the two-point function of the gravitons, gamma k1. You can either write it like this, or you can go to some helicity basis, and then you you write, uh, you know, like uh, for a given helicity. I have hel helicity one, helicity two. There's going to be some delta h1, h2. And uh, yeah, this factor of h is a little bit conventional, but what, what I want you to get from this formula is that there is this factor of 1 over epsilon. We expect epsilon to be very small, so you crank up the size of scalar fluctuations versus the size of graviton fluctuations, okay? Because every, pretty much everything else is the same, delta cubed. K1 cubed. Okay. So this is the answer for the two-point functions. So it's pretty much like a two-point function of a massless scalar field for, for the scalar fluctuation for the graviton fluctuation, but the actual uh, normalization up front is relevant and is encoding the fact that uh, inflation is very much close to, to uh, the sitter space. Uh, and then you're seeing the longitudinal fluctuations before you're seeing the transverse fluctuations of the metric. So, so people want to measure. So this has been measured. This number here is like the 10 to the minus 10 that I, that I wrote before, this coefficient here. But you see, it's, uh, what you're measuring, it's like h over m Planck root epsilon, OK? But now, say we measure primordial gravitational waves. So you learn quite a few things. First of all, you learn it's a generic prediction of inflationary models that you should see gravitational waves. So, okay, so it's a nice confirmation of the paradigm. But also you break the degeneracy between H and epsilon. So you learn what epsilon is. In particular, you learn what H over M Planck is, okay? So if you measure primordial gravitational waves, it means that the Hubble scale during inflation is not that far from the Planck scale. Which I, I let that sink in your, into your head for a second because it's amazing, right? It means that you have something going on in the universe that is close enough to the Planck scale and you can still measure it. So it teaches you that the energy scale of inflation is very high, very high. 
And if we actually people are trying to measure this right now, so um, I'm sure I'm going to butcher the numbers, but uh, roughly speaking, the roughly speaking, just so you have a ballpark. So uh, if you if you compute the ratio between the power spectrum of uh, gravitational waves divided by the power spectrum of scalar fluctuations stripping out these boring parts here, which is fixed by kinematics, uh, then you get essentially epsilon. If you're careful, I think it's 16 epsilon. And so this is usually, re so this is a model thing. So we relate this ratio to something uh, given by our model. But in a model independent way, people call this the tensor to scalar ratio R. Tensor to scalar ratio. So this right now, we know that it's less than 10 to the minus 2. Maybe with some, maybe 0 0.05 or something like that. Okay? So we know this from Planck and so on. And if you're, you're probably not old enough, but a few years ago, we, we thought we had seen it. Um, but it turned out to, anyway, it's a sad story. I can tell you later. So we, we thought we had seen it, uh, but we haven't. So we still don't know what R is. Uh, so we have a, an upper bound right now. And uh, over the next five to 10 years, uh, but experiments, like, uh, I don't know, one example is an experiment from Japan called Lightbird. And I'm sure there's, there's like a bicep, there's like other stuff, maybe CMB experiments. Anyway, so we expect to get to either measure something or get to our order 10 to the minus 3. Okay, so we're going to get uh, more than an order of magnitude better. So if they are around the corner, we'll see them. If they're not, it's sad, but okay. But if we see them, let's uh, believe in that for a second. Then it means that H is, uh, M Planck is order, order 10 to the 19 GeV. It means that H is uh, roughly speaking order 10 to the 14 or 13 GeV. Maybe a little bit less than that. But okay, this number is huge. Oh, it's uh, enormous. Uh, energy scale. So it begs the question, can we use this to do particle physics? Okay. So the answer is yes. So it's a very powerful particle collider, but as, unfortunately with very low luminosity because the experiment is run just once, right? So we have to somehow dig out of these uh, primordial correlations some information about particle physics. So the the next uh, few lectures are going to be about how to understand how you extract particle physics and how we can leverage all of these uh, developments in particle physics to understand cosmological correlators. Okay? So, um, right. Last thing I want to say about, about these uh, fellas here is how you compute the spectral index. Okay? Because if I look here, uh, it, it seems that I'm getting a scale invariant, two-point function. But there is a small catch. So you're making a small mistake by assuming that uh, these parameters are constant. Okay? And if you look back in the, in the formula for the mode function of the scalar field, you'll see something interesting. So let's write uh, the, the formula for the classical solution of a scalar field, massless. So it looks like this. It's like one, forget about the normalization for a second. And it's like one plus I k eta e to the minus I k eta, okay? So now for eta going to zero, it goes to a constant, one. And for eta going to minus infinity, it's like a plane wave, e to the minus i k eta. Okay, well, maybe with the eta up front. Okay, so so uh, there is a turnover uh, between like plane wave-like behavior and uh, freeze-out constants. So this happens 
when k eta is order one. So for k eta much bigger than one, then you have more behavior more like plane wave. For k eta much less than one, it uh, behaves like a frozen fluctuation. So when k eta equals to one, if I fix the co-moving wavelength, there will be some special value of eta for which this is true. So we say that the mode cross the horizon. What this means is that uh, at these moments, the physical wavelength of the mode, recall that the physical wavelength is being redshifted by the expansion of space-time. This moment, the physical wavelength of the mode is precisely equal to the Hubble radius. Okay. So for k, for k eta much less than 1, the physical wavelength is much bigger than the Hubble radius and vice versa. So because the Hubble radius is time dependence now, we are in inflation, not quite in the sitter, every mode will cross the horizon and will feel a slightly different value of the Hubble parameter. Okay, is that clear? So the Hubble parameter is changing during inflation. Every mode crosses the horizon at a different time. So then it feels a different overall value of the Hubble parameter. So when I write H, if I canonically normalize this now, the, the value of H at which I should evaluate the two-point function will be, should be corrected by, by the fact that Hubble has a tiny time dependence. Okay? So if I go back to these formulas, then because I'm focusing on a given co-moving wave number, I should really put h of k here, and same thing for, for this. So they should be evaluated when k eta equals to 1. So that would generate a small red tilt. Why is that? So recall that inflation, the effective Hubble parameter is reducing a little bit. The energy density is going down. So every time a mode crosses the horizon, so modes that cross the horizon much later, they feel a slightly smaller Hubble parameter. Right? While modes that cross very early on, they feel a bigger Hubble parameter. So that's why you have a small red tilt. So shorter energy, shorter distance scales are related to modes that cross the horizon later. So they feel a slightly smaller Hubble parameter. Okay? So if you take this into account carefully, you're going to get the, the spectral index. It's coming really from the fact that there is a small co-moving wavelength dependence in the Hubble parameter and in the slow row parameter. Okay? If you actually do the computation, uh, you get you get the following. So ns minus 1 is given by minus 2 epsilon minus eta. Okay? And nt, well, this is a dream, right? So if we can measure the power of gravity waves and also the, the tilt is given by minus 2 epsilon. So this has been measured. Actually, I do have the number here, which is uh, 0 0.96 minus 1 plus or minus 0 0.01. Okay. Well, for the two-point function of scalars, uh, I do have the number. Just so you see some actual numbers, you know, it's, the, it's related to the real world. So equals AS. Delta k1 plus k2 or k cubed and as 2.14 plus or minus 10 to the minus 9. I hope that's uh, 10 to the minus 9. Yes, this is this. Hmm? Yeah, so we, an S minus 1 is given by this formula, which is given by 0 0.96 minus 1. Hmm? Yeah, this is 0 0.04, right? Ah, 
Yeah, unfortunately, people call it very number very close to one minus one. So, so <laughs> anyway, yeah. So this is the maybe better way of writing it. Okay. Questions? Uh, I have uh, half an hour. Is that right? Uh, so maybe let's, it's a good time to have a break because uh, then we're going to get back and talk about higher point correlation functions. So let's stop for five minutes. Maybe you want the energy scale to be above uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis energy scale or something like that. It's just that the simplest models of inflation will, not, will predict a high, high energy scale. But it's a free parameter. Okay. All right, so now uh, I showed you the computation of the two-point function. It's pretty much the two-point function of a massless field. And, well, uh, the only thing that has been measured in, the, in our universe is related to the two-point function of scalar fluctuations, okay? And uh, we're trying to measure the two-point function of tensor fluctuations, and that's an important experimental target for various reasons, to corroborate the inflationary model and also to measure the energy scale of inflation. But it's a two-point function. As I'll show you maybe throughout the week, it's pretty much fixed by symmetry. There's very little you can do. But once you go beyond the two-point function, there is much more model-dependent data that has to come in. And uh, we'll also learn much more about the inflationary phase if we measure higher point correlations. Just like in particle physics, we do have two-point functions. We measure like our particles here all the time, two-point functions of electrons and photons and so on. But scattering stuff is very useful. You discover about new particles. Well, you discover the whole standard model if you smash things into each other, right? So we would like to understand how interactions play a role in cosmological correlators and what kind of physics they encode. Okay? So that's what we're going to be doing for the rest of the lectures. Naively speaking, uh, every time you have an extra fluctuation, you pay roughly a price of 10 to the minus 5 if these fluctuations are weakly coupled. So you understand why it's hard to measure them. So it's like 10 to the minus 5 down compared to the size of the two-point function. So it's observationally very hard, but I don't know how else to learn about early universe cosmology. So I would say that our job as theorists is to understand and push the theory as far as we can, maybe try to carve theory space and understand all that can be understood, and hopefully experiment will catch up and teach us something new and we'll be prepared for when the time comes. Okay? So, we talked about free field theory pretty much, and uh, everything else now will be related to interactions. Uh, if you have an interacting field theory, then the correlation functions don't follow Wick's theorem, right? So, uh, they're not a Gaussian process, so cosmologists call it non-Gaussianity. But non-Gaussianity is just a different word for interactions. Every time you have an interacting, uh, in non-trivial interaction between the fluctuations, you will have a certain level of non-Gaussianity. And we do expect it's inevitable to have some non-Gaussianity in inflation because it's a gravitational theory. So there will be gravitational mixing between the scalars and the gravitons. So that will predict a certain level of of non-Gaussianity, which was computed in a paper by Maldacena that I referred to earlier on, but it's super, super small, okay? But, uh, okay, that's just the way it is. And uh, we're going to see uh, what happens if you go beyond the, the minimal amount of uh, mixing, what kind of physics we can learn, okay? So let me, let me start by just defining the observable. So the first thing we want to do 
So the first thing that we're interested in is the three-point function. of the scalar fluctuations, OK? And because of translational symmetry, there's going to be a delta function of momentum conservation, and then a generic function up front. Because of uh, rotational symmetry, it only depends on the absolute values of the, of the momenta, OK? There are, uh, uh, for triangles, there, the relative angles can be traded for the sides of the triangle. So this function B is called the bispectrum, for reasons I don't understand, but it's called the bispectrum. And uh, one way of encoding non-Gaussianity so the amplitude of the, of the bispectrum is encoded in the following way by, so the, uh, some parameter called FNL. So NL comes from nonlinearity. Okay? So every time you open a Planck paper or some cosmology paper on non-Gaussianity, people refer to FNL. So I'm just defining it for you. It's just some uh, uh, simple way of uh, characterizing how large the signal is. So of course, um, because it's a function of three variables, this uh, bispectrum function will of course, depend on at what arguments you're evaluating it, but it's just convenient to uh, to talk about a single number. So what people do is they take all equilateral triangle. So you set all the momenta to be the same, and you divide it. Yeah, let me just introduce some extra notation: zeta k1, zeta k2, the two-point function. 2 pi cubed delta k1 plus k2. This is the power spectrum of k1. You divide by the power spectrum squared. OK. OK. Ah, and, uh, yeah, it's just conventional. Don't ask me why to put a 5 over 18 here. OK. Anyway. So a couple of things. So of course, the level of F and L will depend on the specific function. Okay. So one thing that people talk about is they, they associate a shape for specific choices of this function B. They talk about a different type of F and L. So things that you will hear often in the literature are things called F and L local and F and L equilateral. And so FNL um, local is just related to a, a, a bispectrum, some function of the three momenta that peaks around the, 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 when the triangle gets squashed like this. Okay? So F, if, if the size of the bispectrum is bigger for a triangle that's squashed like this, versus a triangle that is in like equilateral shape, then this is called FNL local. Okay. And equilateral, I guess you can imagine that's when this happens. Okay. So any sh any shape that comes from inflation, first of all, you should ask me a few questions. First of all, what's the size of the triangle? It doesn't matter because of scale symmetry. Remember that if I rescale something, it's a symmetry of the Sitter space. So uh, the, the three-point function depends on the shape, but doesn't depend on the overall size of the triangle. Okay? So I don't care about the overall shape. Uh, okay. And 
here, it's, uh, again, it's conventional. Even the local shape, even though, you know, uh, th here the signal is the weakest, we still talk about the overall size by computing the shape in the equilateral configuration. So that tends to cause some confusion. Also, notice the following. If I restore back the zetas, roughly speaking, okay, roughly speaking, this is like the three-point function, zeta cubed, divided by zeta squared squared. Okay? So, well, first of all, if you're worried about uh, dimensions, this is dimensionless, so it's okay. Uh, but it's a little bit of a, of a weird choice because, you know, zeta is very small. So if you have FNL big, you're still doing very well. Okay, so we say, for example, FNL equilateral right now is constrained to be. Let's see. So FNL local at the moment is constrained to be order five, or, well, FNL equilateral is constrained to be order 50, okay? And uh, you'd say, wow, it can still be highly nonlinear, like a 50 coupling constant, but it's because you're paying a price of 10 to the fifth here, okay? There's an extra factor of zeta downstairs, okay? So this is actually quite weakly coupled even if it's order 50. So this, uh, this is a very clean target, both experimentally and also theoretically, because it's hard. It's, as I'll show you later, it's hard to generate some non-trivial amount of power uh, in that configuration, in this type of configuration. While your run-of-the-mill interaction, any interaction term you write, will generate quite a bit of power at uh, the equilateral configuration. The only problem is that this is the thing that is most degenerate with late universe stuff. You know, there's this thing called the late universe that annoys you on the way of uh, trying to decode what's happening in the early universe. So gravitational nonlinearities that kick in later on, they, uh, they mix up with the primordial stuff. So it's harder to measure this FNL equilateral, okay? So, uh, okay, this is uh, related to the size of the three-point function. So now we're gonna talk about some examples of uh, how you compute and what kind of physics they encode, the, the different three-point functions. So what's the first thing you can have? So the first example, uh, I guess I alluded it to, but it's um, the one that Maldacena computed, but it's more complicated. So I'll start with a simpler example of equilateral non-Gaussianity. Which was computed by Criminelli. Criminelli, I think 2004. And the idea is the following. Say you have some irrelevant operator in the Lagrangian of a slow row. So you have the Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian contains uh, a term that looks like this, d mu phi to the fourth over lambda to the fourth. Okay? So some irrelevant operator. Actually, it turns out that if you only care about the scalar sector, this is the unique uh, leading order irrelevant operator that you can write down. So all the irrelevant uh, four derivative operators were classified by Weinberg uh, in a paper uh, around 2008, and he showed that if you do field redefinitions and work uh, a little bit hard, then uh, everything boils down to three operators, and uh, the other two are related to the gravitational sector. 
So a leading order in the scalar sector, this is the only thing that you can write. So this operator does a couple of things. And uh, perhaps the simplest way of understanding it is to let's write phi equals phi bar plus fluctuation delta phi. Okay. And of course, it will induce a four-point function, but that's uh, very weak. We want to see if it generates some interesting three-point function. So let's take the operator and put one of the legs on the background solution. So there will be something. So there will be something that looks like phi bar dot delta phi dot d mu delta phi squared, okay, plus higher order, ta, ta, ta. Actually, if you go to second order, it generates a term that uh, phi bar dot squared over lambda to the fourth delta phi dot squared. So this term is interesting for a variety of reasons. So um, if you plug it back into the quadratic Lagrangian, it will detune the time dependent and the spatial dependent part of the Lagrangian of the scalar fluctuations. So it generates a small speed of sound. So you break Lorentz symmetry of the scalar sector. But in effective field theory, it's uh, highly suppressed, right? It goes like phi dot squared over so if you are cut off, high energy cut off to the fourth. So there are models in string theory that overcome this in which you can make the speed of sound, uh, like uh, the deviation of the speed of sound from one to be non-perturbative in the sense that a CS squared minus one can be, you know, like uh, not parametrically close to one. And uh, so they have an interesting phenomenology. Sorry, I didn't make myself clear. So th if you work perturbatively, this will give a tiny, pretty much negligible correction to the speed of sound. Uh, but if you study models from string theory, then you can actually uh, find some models in which the speed of sound can significantly deviate from being order one. And those models are observationally interesting. And of course, they have to come from some UV completion, like string theory. They can't come from just writing some effective field theory of some high energy cutoff, because otherwise you won't generate this order one correction to the speed of sound. OK? But this, this, uh, this is just uh, some small correction in effective field theory to the quadratic Lagrangian. We drop this. And this term is more interesting. You see, it induces some non-trivial three-point coupling between the fluctuations. So now if I draw these uh, diagrams that I've been drawing, here's the end of inflation. I will have some non-trivial contact interaction between three scalar fluctuations. And there will be some effective vertex here, delta phi dot, d mu delta phi square lambda to the four pi bar dots. And okay, it's, it's actually not entirely trivial to compute this uh, correlation function. Let me just um, introduce this red leg here. So this red leg is just uh, uh, reminding you of the fact that this came from some covariance operator in which I did a small tweak. I took one of the four legs and I thought that, and I think it's a very long wavelength fluctuation. And then the three other hard short wavelength fluctuations live on the background set up by this long wavelength or, or this background fluctuation. Is that clear? So I just deformed the d phi to the four by taking one of the legs to have super long wavelength. So these three other fluctuations, they feel that they're not quite like in the sitter. They're in a slightly deformed background, some inflationary background. So this is one example of equilateral non-Gaussianity. And now I can write the formula for the bispectrum, but actually it's quite complicated. Maybe I should do that just to impress you, but uh, it's quite, it's, uh, there's some complicated formula. 
And we're going to learn to compute it without thinking very hard. So that's the point of this bootstrap, that we're going to leverage some basic stuff about symmetries and not, not think very hard about how to do it. And we're going to get the right answer. But if you do it, the standard way with perturbation theory is actually quite non-trivial. You have to do some time integrals of this vertex and so on, and you get some fairly lengthy formula. But as I'll show you, it's fully pinned down by symmetry. You don't need to work very hard. But I want to explain to you why it's equilateral, why the power peaks around the equilateral triangle versus the collapsed triangle. So, again, notice that, you know, the, the, there is only one contact interaction. Okay? So this has to do with the actual history you're telling yourself in the bulk. There is only one contact interaction. And as I said, you know, the, the, there is, for every mode, there is a turnover point. So all modes behave as if they're in flat space for very early times. And then at late times, they tumble and freeze out. And that happens around k eta order 1 for every mode. Okay? But now there are three modes. You have to correlate three different modes. There's k1 eta 1, k2 eta 2, k3 eta 3. Okay? But now if all the modes have similar co-moving size, then it means that there is a single time scale. So for equilateral, there's a single time scale, k eta, or the one, for which the signal peaks. So that's great. It means that there's a single time for, that will dominate the overall size of the diagram. So you should expect some, no, some decent amount of signal when k eta, when uh, all the modes have similar size. But now, if I go to this configuration, there is some hierarchy. Say k1 is much smaller than k2, k3. So now there are two different time scales. There's the time scale when mode 1 exits the horizon, and there's time scale when 2, when the two other modes exit the horizon. So, you know, you draw the diagram. Now there are two different times. Uh, let's say that uh, this is a long mode, k1. So the earlier time, eta1, is here. So mode 1 is very happy. It exits the horizon with a lot of power here. But the two other modes, they are still deep inside the horizon. So they don't really fluctuate very hard. Okay. So there is very small amount of signal here. Now you can run the same story for eta 2. Now you go to eta 2. And now the modes 2 and 3 are very happy. They exit the horizon with a lot of power. But k1 has frozen out by now. Okay? So the mode 1 is just the background under which these two guys exit the horizon. So there is no non-trivial amount of interaction. So the moment that you set up this uh, hierarchy between modes, if the interaction is hard contact-like, you generate two different time scales at which the various modes would like to be generated. But then the time scale that is good for a certain number of modes is bad for the other, and vice versa. Okay, well, for the equilateral configuration, they all want to exit at roughly the same time scale, so there is no trivial amount of signal there. Okay? So given this information, so let me draw this diagram here. Given this information, there I have eta 1. So here the signal is very faint for the two other modes. And then there is eta 2 here. How do I set up some non-trivial amount of correlation between, between these three different particles in this uh, squeezed configuration? How do you suggest I set up some non-trivial correlation? 
exactly. So you add an extra particle. So you break the, the idea that ever, the physics is controlled by a single, a single uh, hard contact interaction. So if you have now a new state, if you have a new state, now the new state can propagate and mediate some non-trivial interaction. And now you have some decent amount of power between these two different time scales. Okay? If the state is very heavy, it's not capable of doing that. Right? So remember that heavy states, their power red shifts away very fast. But if the mass of the particle is order Hubble or less, then you will be able to set up some non-trivial correlations. Okay? So this so this is how you're going to leverage inflation into a particle collider. Because you go close to this squeeze configuration, and if you see some signal there, it's going to tell you something about the mass of a new state. But now uh, our job is to, fig to find some template for the signal that correctly interpolates between something that looks like this long-range interaction for the squeeze configuration all the way to something that looks like a hard interaction when, it, when you go into contact. In, sorry, when you go into this equilateral, equilateral-like configuration. Okay? Is that clear? Again, if you have non-trivial signal in this squeeze configuration, then it tells you about some new states. So we're going to learn how the new state's uh, uh, information is encoded in uh, this squeezed uh, triangle. But then our job is to compute the full shape. We need to understand how, this how the signal behaves here and how it interpolates into something that looks like a contact interaction when all the momenta have equal size. Okay? So, so that's, uh, that's the task. And for the example, for the example that was computed by Maldacena, the minimal level of non-Gaussianity, he did precisely this diagram so, uh, for graviton exchange. Okay? So graviton. It's this diagram, but when the exchange particle is the graviton. Okay. So in particular, mass equals zero, spin equals two. Okay. So, how much time do I have? Ten minutes, okay. So a couple of things about this diagram. So notice that here I'm taking one of the, did I b b destroy this? Mm. Okay, so there, there is, um, I'm taking the soft limit, or well, one of the legs here on the, on the left. So how can I exchange a graviton between scalar particles? So if I have this diagram here, graviton exchange, each pair on the right, even though they're scalars, they can have orbital angular momentum. Okay. So their orbital angular momentum gets converted into the spinning uh, angular momentum of the graviton, propagates, and it produces a pair of particles with relative angular momentum. But now once I take one of the legs to be very soft, by angular momentum conservation, I can't, have, uh, I can't possibly have uh, the graviton propagating. Okay? But what I still have is the Newtonian potential between these different legs. So what happens in the soft limit is essentially I'm exchanging the Newtonian potential between these, uh, between these uh, different, different legs, OK? So that's, uh, that's uh, what was computed by Maldacena. We're going we're gonna to repeat this uh, computation from this bootstrap point of view. But now, once you start this, uh, at this diagram here, 
you can ask yourself the question, why can't I do it for any particle? Any particle. This signal tends to be small because this is a gravitational interaction. So these vertices are Planck suppressed. Right? But now I add some extra particle. I don't know, some UV completion of inflation and so on. And I, I can ask the question, why can't I have a diagram that will have Why can't I have something like this? A particle of mass m and spin s. And the answer is I can. So our task will be to understand in the next few lectures how you compute, first of all, these uh, hard contacts-like interactions. It's an important stepping stone. And then to understand how to compute this type of uh, three-point diagram when you exchange a generic particle of mass m and spin s, OK? And the nice thing about it is that if you understand this diagram, then for any model of slow row inflation uh, in which uh, the scalar field dominates the background evolution and these uh, extra particles are just in inducing correlations through these uh, mediator-like processes, Okay, so this is a, a big number of slow row like models. If you understand this diagram, you understand all possible shapes of the three point function. So then the only freedom you will have are related to the spectroscopy, the mass and the spin of these new particles and the three point coupling of the theory, the three point coupling between scalars and these new states. And you have like a model independence catalog of inflationary correlation functions. Okay? So our task for the next few lectures is to decode, first of all, the physics of this, uh, of this diagram here. And we're going to go to various kinematical limits and understand what kind of how we do particle spectroscopy. And then we're going to learn a method to do precision calculations of how you compute the full shape of non-Gaussianity. And this is what this cosmological bootstrap is all about. It's about computing uh, these, uh, these uh, non-Gaussianities from, from some new perspective without referring to explicit models or explicit bulk time evolution. Okay? So I think I'm not going to tease you on, uh, I was going to tease you on how the signal looks like, but maybe I'll save that for, for other lectures. Okay, so just short recap before we finish. So these cosmological fluctuations are small, they're weakly coupled, so we're going to work on the three level approximation, and we're interested in two different types of cubic interactions, either hard contact interactions or interactions mediated by a, a new particle. So we can do particle spectroscopy and learn about particles of mass, maybe order 10 to the 14 GeV. So how do we measure their mass? How do we measure their spin? How do we do collider physics by looking up in the sky? And also, how do we compute these uh, things in detail? As I hinted to you, this has to be related somehow to a four-point function in the sitter space. Right? So here I'm assuming some non-trivial time-dependent background, but notice that it's I can I can all, always trace this back to some computation in the sitter space of a four-point function. So I'll convince you that all these inflationary three-point functions are really the sitter four-point functions in this guise. So not only we're gonna accomplish computing the three-point function. As a bonus, we also compute the four-point function because the nice thing is that in inflation, that four-point function is given, the leading four-point function is given by the De Sitter approximation, unlike the three-point function. And I'll explain that why in the next lectures. If you impose full De Sitter symmetry, you'd get a unique three-point function. That's too restrictive. Okay. So we, we want to get a family of um, inflationary three-point functions and they come from the Sitter four-point functions. 
So that's uh, the roadmap for the next couple of lectures. And everything will be about external scalars. And if we're very fast and you understand everything, maybe I'll say certain things about spinning particles on the outside, because it's a different story. It's extremely interesting for conceptual reasons. So I'll stop. Thank you.